Hi guys, today we'll continue our discussion on thermodynamics, okay? So we'll start off from our previous discussion, which was on the first law of thermodynamics, okay? So from there, we defined a number of terms, including energy and the different ways to transfer that energy, such as heat and work. And we also saw that it is the transfer of energy that can lead to changes in the parameters of a system, okay? So the first law, as a review, just sets rules on how energy transfers can occur, and we saw that energy is essentially conserved, okay? There are, however, limitations to the first law, okay? So while we know that if a system transfers energy to the surroundings, we know that no energy is lost in the process, okay? So that is, energy lost by the system is going to be gained by the surroundings, okay? However, the first law does not really give us any sense of direction, okay? So while the first law gives us a set of possible processes, it does not tell us which is the most probable or which actually does happen in a given set of conditions, okay? Because the first law tells us that the reverse process can happen as well, okay? But it does not really tell us which direction actually does happen, okay? So in other words, the first law does not tell us anything about which process is spontaneous, okay? Intuitively, however, we do have a sense of what can and what can't happen naturally. Okay, so let's take this video as an example. So as we're playing this video, there doesn't seem to be anything off about it, right? Because we know that ice, when placed on a table at room temperature, tends to melt, okay? So the process is spontaneous, okay? However, if we look at the next clip, Okay, so just by watching it, we know that it's playing in reverse, right? So what's happening in the second video here is not likely to happen at all in real life, okay? So it's, it's going to be super weird, right, if we have a puddle of water that suddenly froze up into these nice ice cubes here, okay? So we know that only one direction actually happens, okay? So the melting of ice at room temperature is therefore irreversible okay so the reverse process over here in the second video does not really happen okay keep in mind however that there's actually no violation of the first law in either case okay so energy is still conserved in both of these cases but we do know that only one direction actually happens spontaneously so the first law is therefore insufficient to tell us the criteria for spontaneity okay but luckily, we do have another law that could lead us to that criteria, okay? So the directional nature of permissible processes is addressed by the second law of thermodynamics, okay? So a bit of spoilers over here. The second law of thermodynamics leads to the deduction of a state function entropy that for isolated systems, the equilibrium position corresponds to maximum entropy, so overall, for spontaneous processes, the entropy tends to increase until it reaches the equilibrium state, which corresponds to maximum entropy. Okay, so we'll explain what all this means a little later on exactly, but I just wanted to get this out here because it's kind of a long story on how entropy was introduced as a thermodynamic parameter. Okay, so the deduction of the state function actually came from a very practical question namely the development of the cyclic heat engine, okay? So the heat engine was developed during the Industrial Revolution. So what it is basically is that it converts heat to continuous mechanical work, okay? So typically people burn coal in order to boil water and use the steam produced in order to drive pistons, which then provided the useful mechanical work, okay? So we'll look at how this works exactly later on. So overall, people just wanted to maximize the efficiency of heat engines, as in they want to convert as much heat into continuous mechanical work, all right? So let's look at the basic schematic of a heat engine, okay? So overall, we have our cyclic heat engine, okay? So we have heat flow from the surroundings, which then increases the internal energy of the engine, okay? So the engine then converts that internal energy into work, Okay, so if you want to calculate efficiency, it's just going to be the magnitude of work done by the engine divided by the heat input. Okay, so this pretty much tells us how much work can you get out of this heat input. Okay, 
So note that the first law of thermodynamics doesn't really stop us from having a heat engine that will convert all of the heat input into work. Okay, so we have this conversion of energy, right? Okay, so heat in, work out. Okay, so but while the algebra works out, does it actually happen? Okay, so let's think about what's actually happening for this type of process over here. Okay, so if we're having heat flow, what is the molecular basis for this? Okay, so the molecular basis for heat flow is that when we have heat flow, we're increasing the random molecular motion in our system. Okay, and then for our heat engine, we want it to convert some of that random molecular motion into an orderly molecular motion, which is our work. Okay, so also know that since we just have a heat reservoir, this means that our engine is just operating at a single temperature, as in we just have continuous heat input that gets converted to work. So that means we can look at what happens exactly if we try to do this in isothermal conditions, okay? So let's recall our reversible isothermal expansion of an ideal gas, okay? So let's pretend that we're trying to make a cyclic heat engine out of this type of process over here, okay? So if we are expanding our gas from V1 to Vf, okay, that means our system is going to be doing work, okay? So let's recall additional things about an isothermal expansion of an ideal gas. Okay, so we know that for an isothermal process for an ideal gas, delta U is going to be equal to zero, okay? But we know that delta U is also going to be equal to Q plus W. So that means for an isothermal process, okay, so we have Q, is equal to negative W, okay? So if we're doing an expansion process, that means all of the heat input, okay, goes directly into doing work, okay? So this seems like a pretty good process for our heat engine, right? Okay, so all of the heat gets converted to work, right? Okay, so why are we considering reversible processes, by the way? Okay, we're doing a reversible process because we know that for a reversible expansion, okay, this corresponds to the maximum work done by the gas, okay? So we're maximizing the amount of work that the gas could do, okay? But keep in mind, so while it looks like we're going to have 100% efficiency with this, keep in mind that we want to have, again, a cyclic process, okay? So that means we need to bring back the gas from the state to the original state, okay? So recall again from our schematic that we're just operating at a single temperature, right? So in order to put our gas back to the original state, it also has to be at isothermal conditions, okay? So we could do this reversibly as well, okay? So if we do a compression reversibly, this is going to be the minimum work done on the gas, okay? So there's always going to be some work that has to be done in order to bring back the gas to the original state, okay? So let's calculate this actually. So for reversible work, let's look at the expansion process. This is going to be equal to negative NRT ln Vf over Vi, okay? So this is for the expansion, okay? So if we have some heat input, okay, so this is going to be the work that your gas is going to do, okay? So if we're doing the compression, however, okay, this is going to be equal to the reversible compression is equal to negative nRT ln, okay, so final volume is Vi Vf, Okay, so know what's going to happen here, guys, is that if you sum these two things together, okay, so the net work done in this process, if we have a reversible expansion and a reversible compression back to the original state, is going to be zero, okay? So overall, if we try to do this isothermally, we're not going to get any work done after all, okay? So what's actually happening here, okay, so say that this is your engine, you have your heat in, okay? And then you're going to have your work out, okay? It's actually going to be the same magnitude of work in order to bring it back to the original state. And it's also going to output the same amount of heat, okay? So nothing actually, nothing productive actually happens in this type of process. And you don't get any net work done, okay? So actually in other irreversible cases, if we do this isothermally, it's actually possible that we're going to be deficient in work, as in we're going to do more work in order to compress it back to the original state. 
Okay, so ultimately our dream of having a 100% efficient engine, okay, for a cyclic process, okay, so this is the key here, we want this process to be cyclic, we want to produce continuous mechanical work, okay, it's not actually going to be feasible. So actually it turns out that the second law of thermodynamics prevents this from happening, okay? So extensive studies by a French engineer by the name of C.D. Carnot actually show that for an engine to produce continuous mechanical work, it must exchange heat with two bodies at different temperatures. So this temperature difference here is required for our engine to have continuous function, okay? So let's try to modify our schematic of the heat engine a little bit, okay? So we still have our heat engine over here and we still have our heat in, okay? So this time it's, we're gonna specify where it's coming from. It's gonna come from a so-called hot reservoir at temperature TH, okay? So our heat is gonna come in from this part of the surroundings, okay? So it's gonna be absorbed by the engine, which then converts some of that into useful work. Okay. However, in order for this engine to continuously produce this work, it also needs to discard some of that energy as heat. All right. Okay. So this is required in order to ensure continuous function. Okay. So that the process has net work done while being able to return to its original state. Okay. So overall, we will always lose some heat input as waste heat when trying to do continuous mechanical work. Okay, so if we symbolize all of the stuff that's happening, okay, so we have heat in symbolized by QH, okay, we have heat out symbolized by QC, so this cold reservoir here is at temperature TC, which is lower than TH, and we have our work over here, okay? So if we look at the magnitudes of all of this, okay, so absolute value of QC, this is, so absolute value of the heat input, this is going to be equal to the work plus the wasted heat, okay? So overall, the work that you would be able to output from the cyclic heat engine is just going to be the heat input minus the waste heat, okay? So overall, you cannot have 100% efficiency, okay? So you're gonna have less than 100% efficiency, okay? So actually, this principle here is an alternative statement for the second law of thermodynamics, okay? So this is called your Kelvin-Planck statement of the second law, okay? So it states that it is impossible for a system to undergo a cyclic process whose sole effects are the flow of heat into the system from a heat reservoir and the performance of an equivalent amount of work by the system on the surroundings, okay? So in other words, you cannot have 100% efficiency, okay? So this is not possible. Okay, so we also have this uh, layman's statement of the first and second laws, okay? So based on this, the first law says that you cannot win, okay? So the meaning of this is that whatever you put in, that's exactly what you get out, okay? You cannot get more than that, okay? So this is the conservation of energy principle, okay? So the second law is a little bit more depressing, Okay, so the second law says that you cannot break even. Okay, so this pretty much means that you cannot have 100% efficiency of your engines. Okay, so if ever you're inputting heat, okay, you're always going to get less work done. Okay, so this is your alternative but somewhat more depressing statement of the first and second laws of thermodynamics. Okay, so these are the rules of life. Right. Okay, so let's look at the basic principles of a heat engine in order to understand why it's necessary to have your hot reservoir and your cold reservoir and whatnot, okay? So this is a very, very simplified schematic of a heat engine, okay? So you have two chambers over here, and then you have a piston here as well, okay? So the movement of this piston is what's going to cause your continuous mechanical work. We'll see that the continuous mechanical work can be achieved by moving the piston forward and backwards over and over again, okay? So first, this can be done by an input of heat, okay? So that heat input that we saw earlier, that is usually done in order to increase the temperature 
of our working substance. Okay, so the working substance is usually steam. Okay, so we're gonna put our steam into this chamber over here. Okay, so this is gonna fill this up. Okay, so it's going to increase the temperature. So this is going to contrast against the cooler gas in this chamber over here. Okay, so this steam over here is at a higher temperature. So it's also at a higher pressure. Okay, so therefore you have a net force that is moving the piston from this part to this part over here, okay? So you have a net movement of your piston, okay? So while the piston is moving in this direction, it's going to push the cooler gas outwards, okay? So this is going to be your exhaust steam, okay? So eventually, your hot gas over here, it's going to cool down. So now that the piston is over here, we could continue the process, okay? We could have another heat input in order to increase the temperature of our steam, Okay, and then we're gonna have we're gonna have our high temperature steam in this chamber over here this time. So we have we have our hot steam over here. Okay, this is gonna contrast against the cooler gas in this chamber now. So we have a net force going in the opposite direction. Okay, so this is going to move the piston back to the original position. Okay, so we have our hot gas over here that's going to cool down. Okay, and overall we're in the same position as the initial state. So this process is just repeated over and over again in order to have the movement of this piston over here. Okay, so we overall we have continuous mechanical work by heating up our steam and cooling it down. All right. Okay, so let's look at a way in which we can do this process the most efficient way possible. Okay, and that is described by the Carnot cycle. Okay, so the Carnot cycle is described to be the most efficient engine possible because all of the steps involved in the cycle are reversible. Okay, so meaning that we're doing the maximum work done by the gas and we're doing the minimum work done on the gas. Okay, so overall we still have the same basic setup of our cyclic heat engine. Okay, so let's just represent the heat in as QH and the heat out as QC. All right, and the work that we have here is just W. Okay, so let's look at the different steps of the Carnot cycle. Okay, so let's look at a PV diagram in order to describe this. Okay, so over here we have two isotherms representing the heat reservoir and the cold reservoir. Okay, so TH, this is our heat reservoir, and TC, this is our cold reservoir. Okay, so let's start with this initial state over here. Okay, so we are, we are at TH. Okay, so at this point, we could do an isothermal reversible expansion. So overall, we have our QH coming in, and this is going to be equal to some work done by the gas, all right? Okay, so from here, we could further expand our gas, okay, just using internal energy, okay? So from here, we're going to expand further, but we're also going to cool down the gas to TC, all right? Okay, so over here we have our adiabatic expansion, okay? So if we have an adiabatic expansion, we have no heat input, but we're, going, we're still going to expand at the expense of changing the temperature of our gas, right? Okay, so once we're at TC now, we need to start putting our gas back to the original state, okay? So again, we could do an isothermal compression, okay? So we could have some heat loss at this point. So QC is going to be equal to the work done to compress the gas back to some extent, all right? And then we're going to compress it all the way back to the original state, okay, by doing an adiabatic compression, okay? Okay, so again here we have Q is equal to zero, all right? So we're just going to do some additional work Okay, which is then used to increase the temperature of the system. All right. So overall, this is the most efficient way that we could do maximum work while minimizing the heat input and the heat output. Okay. All right. So the net work done by the process is going to be symbolized by this blue shaded region over here. Okay. So this is your work done by the gas minus the work done on the gas. 
All right. Okay. So let's look at each of these steps individually to get a closer look of what happens. Okay. So also keep in mind that we have all these different states over here, which we'll be using to describe this entire cycle. Okay. So let's look at the first step of the Carnot cycle. So this is our isothermal reversible expansion. Okay. So overall for this step, heat is absorbed from the high temperature reservoir to do work. Okay. So this is like when our steam is being heated up by our hot reservoir. And at the same time, it's expanding, okay, and it's pushing the piston, therefore it's doing work. All right, so let's look at what happens here exactly, okay? So since we're dealing with isothermal conditions, our delta U is going to be equal to zero, okay? So this means that any heat input, okay, is going to be equal to the work done by the gas, right? Okay, so since this is reversible, we could describe our work as work reversible, so this is going to be equal to negative NR, th ln v2 over v1 okay so this means that our heat is just going to be equal in magnitude but opposite sign so this is going to be positive nr th ln v2 over v1 okay so we have change in internal energy work and heat involved in this step here okay so now let's look at our next step okay so our next step is a reversible adiabatic expansion okay so this time our gas is just pushing against the piston with no heat input, okay? So at this point, this is when our gas is expanding against the piston, but this time it's now cooling down, okay? So this is done adiabatically, okay? So we, have no, we no longer have any heat input, but our gas is still expanding a bit, but it's going to decrease in temperature, okay? So again, let's look at what's happening here exactly, okay? So since this is an adiabatic process, Q is equal to zero, so that means the work done by the gas is going to be at the expense of the internal energy, okay? So since we're doing work, that means the internal energy is going to decrease and we have a corresponding decrease in temperature, okay? So we're going from the high temperature reservoir to the cold temperature reservoir, okay? So this is going to be equal to NCV, okay, TC minus TH, okay? So we have heat involved and we have our change in internal energy and our work, all right? Okay, so now let's look at when we're going to return our gas to the original state, okay? So this is when we start doing this, okay? So our third step is our reversible isothermal compression. So this is when heat leaves the system into the cold reservoir as the system compresses, all right? Okay, so we're trying to bring back the gas, but at the same time, we're going to be discarding some of this heat as our waste heat, all right? So let's describe what happens here exactly. Okay, so isothermal conditions, delta U is equal to zero. Okay, so that means Q is equal to negative W. So any work done to compress the gas at isothermal conditions is equal to our waste heat, QC, okay? So work reversible can be described as negative NRTC, ln v4 over v3 okay so that means our qc this is going to be equal to positive nr tc ln v4 over v3 all right okay so change in internal energy work and heat okay so now let's look at our last step okay so our last step is what brings our system back to its original temperature which is our th Okay, so this is for reversible adiabatic compression, okay? So all of the work done on the system goes to increase the temperature of the system back to TH, right? So let's look at the parameters here. So Q is equal to, cis to zero since we're dealing with an adiabatic compression, okay? So that means that delta U is equal to W, okay? So this is equal to NCV, okay? So TH minus TC, all right? Okay, so now let's summarize each of the steps over here. Okay, so A to B. Okay, so the work involved here is negative NR TH ln V2 over V1. Okay, and then the heat involved here, this is your QH, which is equal to positive NR TH ln V2 over V1. Okay, so isothermal conditions, delta U is equal to zero. Okay, so B to C, this is an adiabatic process, so Q is equal to zero. Okay, our work here is just NCV, TC minus TH, which is also equivalent to the change in inter internal energy. So that is NCV, TC minus TH. 
Okay, so now let's look at our isothermal compression. Okay, so internal energy is zero. Okay, our work involved here is negative nRTC ln V4 over V3. Okay, and our Q here, this is our QC, our waste heat. So this is positive nRTC ln V4 over V3. Okay, so last step, okay, adiabatic compression, Q is equal to zero. Our work is equal to NCV, TH minus TC, and our change in internal energy is equal to the same thing. Okay, so NCV, TH minus TC, right? So now let's look at the net process, okay? So overall process, okay? We're going to sum each of these steps, okay? Like we usually do for our cyclic processes, right? So if we're looking at the overall change in internal energy, this is expected to be, again, just equal to zero, okay? So if we add these two things together, we get our zero over here okay so this makes sense again since delta u is a state function okay and we're dealing with a cyclic process right so now let's sum up our work okay so our work over here okay so this part here also cancels out okay so our work is just going to be equal to the sum of these two parts over here okay so this is going to be negative nrth ln v2 over v1 okay plus negative nrtc ln v4 over v3 okay so our heat over here okay so this is expected to be equal in magnitude to our net w but opposite in sign so this is going to be nrth ln v2 over v1 plus nrtc ln v4 over v3 okay so these are super long expressions right okay so we have all these different volume values for our heat and our and for our work okay so it'll be nice if we could simplify these two expressions over here okay so we could do that however using the two adiabatic processes okay so let's consider the relationship between v1 v2 v3 and v4 all right so recall the basic relationship between the final and the initial temperatures and the final and initial volumes for a reversible adiabatic process, okay? So we know that from this, Tf over Ti, this is going to be equal to Vf over Vi raised to negative gamma minus 1, right? Okay, so let's look at step 2 and step 4, okay? So for step 2... What's the relationship between the final initial temperatures and the final initial volumes? Okay, so we know that this is going to be Tc over Th. Okay, this is going to be equal to, okay, so final volume that is V3 over V2, okay, raised to negative gamma minus 1. Okay, so let's look at step 4. Okay, so step 4, okay, so what's our final temperature that is Th? So we have TH over TC. This is going to be equal to, okay, so final volume for step four, that is going to be V1 over V4 raised to negative gamma minus one, okay? So we could kind of equate these two expressions here and therefore relate volume one, volume two, volume three, and volume four, okay? So let's reverse this fraction over here, okay? So let's get the reciprocal, Okay, raised to negative 1, and this is going to be equal to Tc over Th, okay? Okay, we're going to flip this fraction over here as well. So this is going to be V4 over V1 raised to negative gamma minus 1, okay? So overall, we have two expressions for Tc over Th, okay? So in this case, Tc over Th is going to be equal to V4 over V1 raised to gamma minus 1, and in this case, V3... Tc over Th is going to be equal to V3 over V2 raised to negative gamma minus 1, okay? So we could equate these two expressions together, okay? So if we do that, okay, we get V3 over V2 raised to negative gamma minus 1 is equal to V4 over V1 raised to negative gamma minus 1, Right? Okay, so since they're both raised to the same exponent, okay, so overall that means that V3 over V2 is just equal to V4 over V1. Okay, so let's just rearrange this to get the ratios of interest, okay? So V4 over V3, this is going to be equal to V1 over V2, or this is going to be equal to V2 over V1 raised to negative 1. 
all right? So we could use this relationship in order to simplify our expressions, all right? So let's try to simplify our Q cycle, okay? So Q cycle, this is the net heat involved for our process, okay? So let's write down the original expression that we have for Q cycle or the net heat involved, okay? So that was equal to nr th ln v2 over v1, right? Plus nrtc ln v4 over v3, okay? So from our initial, from our previous treatment, we had an expression for this in terms of v2 over v1, okay? So we said that v4 over v3 is equal to v2 over v1 raised to negative 1, okay? So we could rewrite this as negative nrth ln v2 over v1, okay, plus nrtc ln v2 over v1, negative 1, okay? So using the rules of logarithms, we could bring this exponent down as a coefficient to the overall logarithm expression, okay? So this could be written as nrth ln v2 over v1 minus nrtc ln v2 over v1, okay? So we can see that we have a lot of common terms, right? So this can be rewritten as nrth minus tc times ln v2 over v1, okay? So this is our expression for Q cycle, all right? Okay, so we could also get a simplified expression for our work cycle. Okay, so recall again that the net work done by a cycle, okay, is going to be equal in magnitude but opposite in sign to the net heat of the cycle. So this is going to be equal to negative nrth minus tc times ln v2 over v1. Okay, so this is our net heat of the cycle and the net work of the cycle, okay? So again, recall that delta U for the entire cycle is just going to be equal to zero, all right? Okay, so we could use the expression that we just derived for the net work done by the cycle in calculating the efficiency of the Carnot cycle, okay? But before we proceed with that, let's look at the different relationships again of the heat in, okay, the work and the heat out, okay? So keep in mind the different signages for these different parameters over here since we're looking at this in terms of the system, which is our engine, okay? So since we have heat in, this is going to be positive, okay? We have work out, okay? So our engine is going to be doing work on the surroundings, so negative sign. And then we're also releasing this, this, this waste heat, okay? So negative sign as well, okay? So let's just use the first law of thermodynamics to relate these different values over here. Okay, so overall we know that the heat input is going to be split up into two parts. Okay, so we have our work and our waste heat. Okay, so that means we could symbolize our work as the input, the heat input minus the waste heat. All right, okay, so keep in mind, however, that QH, this is always going to be positive, so we could get rid of these absolute value signs. Okay, so that means that we could write our work as just QH, okay? So QC, however, this is inherently going to have a negative sign, okay? So if you want to make sure that this is going to have a positive value, this can be written as negative QC, okay? So negative of a negative, this is going to be just positive QC, okay? So overall, we could express the work done by the engine as QH plus QC, all right? Okay, so that means we could write the efficiency as, okay, so work done by the engine, that is W, okay, over heat input, so that is QH, okay? So this can be rewritten as QH plus QC over QH, okay? So this is one expression for the efficiency of our engine, okay? However, we could also write this in terms of the different temperatures involved, okay? So recall that we got an expression for the work done by the engine, okay? So we could rewrite this as, okay, so the net work done by the engine is going to be absolute value negative nr th minus tc, okay, ln v2 over v1, right? 
Okay, so this is the net work done by the engine, so divided by QH. Okay, so our expression from QH, recall, is NRTH ln V2 over V1. Okay, so we can see that a bunch of things are going to cancel out, right? So NR and R cancels out, ln V2 over V1 also cancels out. So we could also write our efficiency in terms of temperatures. Okay, so TH minus TC over TH, all right? Okay, so overall, let's just rewrite our expression for efficiency. Okay, so efficiency can be rewritten as TH minus TC over TH, or it could be also written as QH plus QC over QH. Okay, alternatively, okay, this is just equal to 1 minus TC over TH, or 1 plus QC over QH. Okay, so an additional reminder here is that our QC, okay, our QC is always going to be negative, okay, since it's always going to be given out, right? So this is our alternative expressions for efficiency of a Carnot engine, right? Okay, so overall, the implications of this is that the efficiency of the engine is going to depend on the temperature difference of our hot reservoir and our cold reservoir, okay? Another implication of this is that it's pretty much going to be impossible to have a 100% efficient engine because of this part over here, okay? So in order to have 100% efficiency, okay, our TC actually has to be equal to zero Kelvin, okay, which is not actually possible to happen, right? Okay, so, so overall, for practical purposes, the efficiency of the engine is always going to be less than 100%, all right? Okay, also another reminder for our equations for efficiency, okay, so we have two major expressions, okay, so we have QH plus QC over QH, so this could be written as 1 plus QC over QH, okay, or we could have efficiency in terms of temperatures, so this is TH minus TC over TH, or this could be written as 1 minus TC over TH, right? Okay, so keep in mind that this expression over here, this applies for the Carnot cycle, okay? It's a reversible cycle. However, this over here, this was derived from the basic principles of the conservation of energy, okay? So we base this on this general schematic of our heat engine, okay? So this expression is more generalizable to other, to other engines, whereas this over here is more applicable just to the Carnot cycle. Since we derive this using our expression for net work done by the Carnot engine, okay? Whereas this again was just based on the first law of thermodynamics, okay? Okay, so just be very careful about which equations for efficiency you use, okay? So let's look at this problem over here. So this problem is dealing with two different Carnot engines which operate at a temperature difference of 250 Kelvin, okay? So one engine A has a hot reservoir maintained at 1000 Kelvin while the other engine is maintained at 750 Kelvin, okay? So you want to know which is the more efficient engine. Okay, so since we're dealing with Carnot engines anyway, we could still use the equation in terms of temperatures. Okay, so efficiency is equal to TH minus TC over TH. Okay, so for both engines, the difference between the temperatures of the hot and the cold reservoirs are the same. Okay, so efficiency of A can be written as 250 Kelvin divided by 1000 Kelvin. Okay, so this is going to give us an efficiency of 0 0.25 for engine A. Okay, so for engine B, the efficiency is 250 Kelvin divided by the temperature of the hot reservoir, which is 750 Kelvin. Okay, so this is going to give us a higher efficiency at 0 0.33 Kelvin. Okay, so let's also look at other implications of our equation for efficiency for our Carnot cycle. Okay, so overall, we could write down our efficiency for the Carnot cycle, which is our, again, our reversible engine as 1 minus TC over TH is equal to 1 plus QC over QH. Okay, so again, these expressions are for our reversible 
cycle. Okay? All right. Okay, so let's do a bit of algebra so we could subtract 1 from both of these sides so we could get negative TC over TH is equal to QC over QH. So we could rearrange this expression while putting the expressions for the cold reservoir on one side and the expressions for the hot reservoir on the other side. Okay, so this could give us negative QH over TH is equal to QC over TC. All right, so doing a little bit of additional algebra, we could transfer this term on the other side and we could get QC over TC plus QH over TH is equal to zero for the entire cycle. Okay, so keep in mind that we're dealing with all of the heats involved in the cycle divided by the corresponding temperatures at which they occur. We're adding them all up together and it just so happens to equal to zero. Okay, so what's the implication of this? Okay, so for cyclic processes, okay, when we're calculating the overall value of a certain parameter for a cyclic process, what typically becomes zero? Okay, so what typically becomes zero is if we have a state function. Okay, so recall again earlier that when we were calculating the change in internal energy for the entire Carnot cycle, this ended up being zero. Okay, so the same thing happens for this ratio over here. Reversible heat over the corresponding temperature. Okay, so it also ends up being zero. Okay, so this suggests that this parameter over here, this also happens to be a state function, okay? So actually, this state function here, this is your entropy, okay? So overall, from our investigations of the reversible Carnot cycle, okay, we get this parameter, which is our entropy term. So overall, entropy is a thermodynamic state function defined as the reversible heat flow in a process divided by temperature. Okay, so this expression over here, this gives us the infinitesimally small change in entropy as the infinitely small reversible heat flow divided by temperature. So if you want to get the overall change in, in entropy, we could just integrate from the initial to the final state. Okay, so we get entropy of the initial state to the entropy of the final state. Okay, initial temperature to the final temperature. Okay, so since entropy is a state function, we get delta S. Okay, and we could just keep this inside the integral sign since we're not sure of the dependence of our reversible heat on temperature. So this is just going to be the integral evaluated from the initial temperature to the final temperature of dq reversible over temperature. Okay, so this is our change in entropy for a process of interest. Okay, so note, however, that it's kind of weird since we have to deal with reversible heat. Okay, so it looks like we're just calculating entropies for reversible processes. So the next question is, what about for irreversible processes? Okay, so why are we interested in irreversible processes, by the way? So if we know that a process is irreversible, that means it is spontaneous in that direction. Okay, so the reverse process does not happen, right? So only we, we only have one direction in which this occurs, okay? In our derivation for our expression for entropy, however, we use the Carnot cycle, okay? So based on definition, what is the Carnot cycle? This is all made up of reversible steps, okay? So this is a reversible cycle, okay? So what's the significance of a process being reversible versus irreversible, okay? So a reversible process can still be spontaneous, but the difference here now is that it is in equilibrium. Recall again our discussion on reversible work. We said that our system, if it does reversible work, is constantly in equilibrium with its surroundings, okay? So if we have a reversible process, we know that it is happening at equilibrium, okay? So Earlier, we derived expressions for entropy using the expression of efficiency, okay? So that expression for efficiency was for a reversible process, reversible cycle, namely the Carnot cycle. We could get a relationship for irreversible processes by considering an engine that is irreversible, okay? So that means at least one of its steps 
is an irreversible process. Okay, so since we know that reversible engines are the most efficient engines, that means if we just so happen to have a single irreversible step in one of our cycles, that means its efficiency is automatically going to be less than that of the efficiency of a reversible cycle. Okay, so symbolically we mean that if we have an engine with at least one irreversible step, okay, its efficiency is automatically going to be less than that of an engine that has all steps that are reversible. Okay, so overall it's not possible to have an engine that's going to have a larger efficiency than the Carnot cycle because we pretty much said that the Carnot cycle is the most efficient engine. Okay, so this is like our maximum possible efficiency. So we could write down the efficiency of our irreversible process as 1 plus QC irreversible divided by QH irreversible. Okay, so this is going to be less than 1 plus QC reversible divided by QH reversible. Okay, so these ones could cancel out. Okay, so note that we could write this quantity over here in terms of the temperatures like what we did earlier. Okay, so QC reversible over QH reversible can be written as negative TC over TH. Okay, so this this is one of the relationships that we derived earlier for the efficiency of a Carnot cycle. Okay, so let's just replace this term over here. Okay, so we have QC irreversible divided by QH irreversible is going to be less than negative TC over TH. Okay, so let's do some rearrangement. We have QC irreversible over TC is less than negative QH irreversible over TH. Okay, so rearrange this. Okay, bring this on the other side. We have QC irreversible over TC plus QH irreversible over TH is less than zero. Okay, so contrast this with what we were saying about our Carnot cycle. Okay, so let's just recall what we got for the Carnot cycle. Okay, so for the Carnot cycle, our reversible cycle, we got QC reversible over TC plus QH reversible over TH as equal to zero. This time, however, if we're dealing with an irreversible cycle, okay, the sum of the heats involved for the irreversible process divided by the corresponding temperature is going to be less than zero, okay? Okay, so let's consider an irreversible cycle, okay? So let's generalize this, okay? So we know that for all of the steps of an irreversible cycle, dq irreversible over temperature, okay? So if we integrate this for the entire cycle, so if you want to do this, okay, so we could write the integral sign with a little circle over here to indicate that we're integrating from the initial state all the way to the initial state again, okay? So we're just going through the entire cycle, okay? So for an irreversible cycle, okay, this is going to be less than zero, okay? So overall, our goal here is to try to relate the irreversible heat of a process over its temperature with what we know entropy to be, okay? So this is ds is equal to dq reversible over t, right? Okay, so our strategy here is that since we're dealing with an irreversible cycle, we know that a cycle becomes irreversible if it just has one step that is irreversible, okay? So let's say that our cycle is made up of two steps, okay? So the first step, one to two, this could be our irreversible process, okay? So irreversible, okay? But when we're going back to the initial state, okay, this process could be reversible, okay? But overall, if we're looking at the cycle going from one all the way to, all the way back to one, okay, the process is irreversible since we have an irreversible step, okay? So overall, we could write this as dq irreversible for the irreversible step, okay? So from state one to state two, okay? And for our second step, which is the reversible step, okay, we're going from state two to two one, okay? So this is dq reversible over temperature, okay, so overall, summing these two things together will be less than 
zero. Okay, so we could do a little bit of manipulation for this expression over here. Okay, we could flip over the limits by introducing a negative sign. Okay, so this is going to be negative one to two dq reversible over temperature. Okay, but note, however, that dq reversible this is equal to ds, right? Okay, so we could write this as one to two ds, okay? And then we'll write down this expression down here. So one to two dq irreversible divided by temperature, okay? So this is going to be less than zero, okay? So note that this refers to the same step now, okay? So the entropy change from step one to two, okay? So we could rearrange this. Okay, to give us the following, okay? So 1 to 2 dq irreversible over t. This is going to be less than 1 to 2 ds, okay? So implications of this, the entropy change of going from point 1 to 2, okay, is going to be greater than the irreversible heat involved in the process okay so this is in general the relationship between entropy and the heat involved for an irreversible process okay so in general we can write ds is greater than dq irreversible divided by t Okay, so what's the implication of this? Okay, so let's go to a fresh slide over here. Okay, so in general, for permissible prop processes, ds is going to be greater than or equal to the heat involved in the process divided by t. Okay, so actually this is made up of two parts. Okay, so if ds is equal to dq over t, this is when you have a reversible spontaneous process okay so pretty much you're in equilibrium if your heat involved in the process divided by temperature is equal to your entropy okay however if ds is greater than dq over t this means that you're dealing with an irreversible but spontaneous process, okay? So note what is not allowed, okay? What's not allowed is for ds to be less than dq over t, okay? So overall, a process that involves a heat transfer over temperature greater than ds is not allowed since this implies that the efficiency of a type of cycle that you could have is going to be greater than the efficiency of your reversible cycle. Okay, so this is not allowed since this would imply that you have a super engine. Okay, an engine that is greater in efficiency than your reversible engine, which is not possible. Okay, so overall, this is basically your second law of thermodynamics. Okay. Okay, so let's consider an isolated system for simplicity because for isolated systems, the overall net heat flow is going to be equal to zero. Okay, so let's consider our criteria for spontaneous processes. Okay, so ds has to be greater than or equal to dq over t. Okay, so this has a special name, by the way. This is called your Clausius inequality. Okay, so since for an isolated system, dq is equal to zero, so that means this entire term becomes zero, and our criteria for spontaneity is just that ds has to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so the implication of this is that entropy increases with spontaneous changes in an isolated system. Okay, so finally we have arrived at the basic statement of the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, so... Entropy, this now becomes a quantity that we could use to distinguish between spontaneous and non-spontaneous processes, okay? So if ds is greater than zero, we have an irreversible spontaneous process. ds is equal to zero, it's reversible and spontaneous, okay? So this means we have equilibrium, okay? 
And if ds is less than zero, this process is not allowed. In other words, it is non-spontaneous. Okay, so keep in mind that this is for an isolated system. Okay, we were able to say these statements for an isolated system because the overall heat flow involved for the system is equal to zero. Okay, however, what if we want to expand this for non-isolated systems? Okay, so that means the entropy of the surrounding must also be considered. Okay, but we can also treat the entire universe actually as an isolated system. Okay, so let's kind of draw this out, okay? So say that this is the entire universe, okay? Our system is over here. This is our surroundings, okay? So if ever there's any heat flow between the system and the surroundings, it's just going to be contained within the entire universe, okay? So you could treat the universe as an isolated system. So we, that means we could apply the criteria of spontaneity for isolated systems towards the entire universe by writing ds of the universe, okay, this has to be greater than or equal to zero, okay? So to expand this expression over here, we know that the universe is made up of two parts, right? Okay, so ds universe, this is made up of the entropy of the system plus the entropy of the surroundings. So that means for spontaneous processes, okay, reversible or irreversible, this has to be greater than or equal to zero, okay? So this again, this is pretty much your second law of thermodynamics, okay? So again, let's just look at the summary of the first two laws of thermodynamics, okay? So the first law says that the energy of the universe is constant, whereas in the second law, the entropy of the universe is actually leading to a maximum, okay? Okay, so now that we know which values of entropy correspond to spontaneous processes, let's look at how we could calculate the entropy of the universe in order to determine if our process is going to be spontaneous or not. Okay, so keep in mind that when we're calculating the entropy of the universe, we actually need to calculate the entropy of both the system and the surroundings. Okay, so before we get into that, however, we need to consider how we could calculate these individual parts. Okay, so first and foremost, our definition of entropy states this as follows, okay? So the change in entropy is equal to the reversible heat flow divided by the temperature, okay? So that means we actually need to use reversible heat, okay? What happens, however, if we're interested in processes that are not necessarily reversible, okay? So the great thing, however, is that entropy is a state function, okay? So that means... We could calculate entropy for an irreversible process by using a reversible process, okay? So again, let's have these two states, okay? So state one and state two, see that we're interested in calculating the entropy change from going from one state to the other state, okay? So our process of interest could be an irreversible process, right? But we could, we could still calculate the entropy change by using the reversible pathway, Okay, so again, entropy is a state function, so it just depends on the final and the initial states, and it does not depend on the process in which you get there, okay? So overall, the entropy changes, whether you did the process irreversibly versus reversibly, okay, is still going to be the same thing, okay? So let's look at different examples in which we could calculate this. We'll, initially, we'll look at Okay, so let's look at different examples in which we could calculate the entropy of the universe. Okay, so for our initial examples, we'll be looking at very, very simple systems. Okay, and then next we'll be looking at different ways in which we could calculate the entropy of systems in other processes. So first and foremost, let's look at heat flow from the system to the surroundings. Okay, so we want to investigate what conditions are necessary in order to have a spontaneous heat flow from the system to the surroundings, okay? So keep in mind that our system is going to be at a different temperature, say that it's going to be a temperature T system, and our surroundings is going to be at a certain temperature T surroundings, okay? So let's look at if there is going to be a temperature requirement for a spontaneous heat flow, all right? So let's calculate the change in entropy for the system, okay? So delta S system, okay? So this is just going to be equal to negative Q, divided by T system, okay? So it's releasing this heat, 
okay, at this corresponding temperature. All right? Okay, so let's look at the entropy change for the surroundings. Okay, so delta S surroundings. Okay, so while the system is releasing this heat, your surroundings is going to be absorbing this heat. So this time we're going to have positive Q divided by T surroundings. Okay? So overall, in order to calculate the entropy of the universe, we have Q over T surroundings minus Q over T system. Okay? So keep in mind again that in order for this process, this heat transfer to be spontaneous, Delta S universe has to be a positive value, okay? So this means that this process is only going to be spontaneous if this temperature, T surroundings, is lower than T system, okay? So this allows this quantity over here to be larger than this so that our Delta S universe is going to be positive. Okay, so overall, the temperature of our surroundings has to be less than the temperature of our system, okay? Okay, so this implies that spontaneous heat flow comes from higher temperatures to lower temperatures, okay? So what happens then if T system is equal to T, T surroundings, okay? So this implies that delta S universe is equal to zero for the process, okay? So when these temperatures are now equal, there is no heat flow anymore, okay? So this implies that the system and the surroundings are going to be in thermal equilibrium. Okay, so now let's look at another process, okay? So let's go back to the cyclic heat engine with no cold reservoir, okay? And we'll see how this process is not going to be spontaneous based on the second law of thermodynamics, okay? So in this particular case, we just have our surroundings, this is our heat reservoir. Okay, so this is at a temperature TH, okay? And we're dealing with a cyclic process, right? So overall, if we're dealing with a cyclic process, delta S system is going to be equal to zero, okay? So now let's consider our delta S surroundings, okay? So our surroundings is always going to be inputting heat in towards our system, okay? So this is QH. Okay, so relative to the system, QH is positive, but relative to the surroundings, it is negative. Okay, so your surroundings is giving off heat to be absorbed by the system. Okay, so this gives us negative QH divided by TH. All right, okay, so if we're going to calculate delta S universe, okay, so this is going to be equal to the entropy of the system, which is equal to zero, plus the entropy of the surroundings, which is equal to negative QH over th okay so we can see here that we have zero plus a negative value so overall this is going to be negative okay so for a cyclic heat engine with no cold reservoir the entropy of the universe is going to be negative so this implies this is not permissible okay so this does not really happen okay so let's try to calculate the entropy change of a system for other processes. Okay, so keep in mind that we'll be limiting ourselves to the consideration of the system only in our discussion from now on. Okay, so additional processes for closed systems that we want to consider include isochoric processes, isobaric, isothermal, adiabatic, reversible phase changes, and mixing processes. Okay, so you might think that this is a lot of stuff to go over, but keep in mind that you're probably familiar with how to calculate many of these already from our previous discussion. Okay, but there's going to be a few subtle things to keep in mind, which we could see in our first example. Okay, so we could try to calculate the change in entropy for an isochoric process. Okay, so for an isochoric process, okay, we could look at what the reversible heat is going to be. So this is just going to be equal to dQV, okay? So dQV, this is equal to NCV dt, okay? So these definitions were established from our previous discussion, okay? So if we're going to calculate dS, dS is going to be equal to dQ reversible over temperature. So that means it's equal to NCV dt over t, okay? So upon integration, okay, so from S1 to S2, Okay, temperature 1 to temperature 2. Delta S in general is just going to be temperature 1, temperature 2, NCV dt over T. Okay? 
So let's consider some cases. So if CV is constant, okay, we could evaluate this integral, okay, as follows, okay. So we could say that delta S is just going to be equal to NCV ln T2 over T1, okay. If, however, it's going to be dependent on temperature, you might need to take into account the variation of CV with temperature. So in that case, delta S is going to be equal to N. Okay, so integrate this from temperature 1 to temperature 2. We have A plus BT plus CT squared all over temperature times DT. Okay, okay so this is if CV varies with temperature. Okay, so actually the same thing can apply for isobaric processes, okay, so we'll limit ourselves to cases where there are no phase changes, okay, so for isobaric processes, the reversible heat is just going to be dqp, okay, so dqp is defined as ncp dt, okay, so in this case, our entropy is going to be equal to dq reversible over t, right, so this is just going to be equal to ncp dt over t. Okay, so upon integrating this, okay, so if Cp is constant in the temperature range of interest, okay, delta S is just going to be equal to Ncp ln T2 over T1, okay, right? If, however, if Cp varies with temperature, okay, so our integration has to take into account the variation of Cp with temperature. So this is going to be N, temperature 1, temperature 2, okay, A plus Bt plus Ct squared onwards, if ever, divided by T times dt. All right, so let's try this problem over here. Okay, so in this particular problem, we have two samples of silver at different temperatures. One piece of silver is at 150 degrees Celsius, and another piece of silver is at zero degrees Celsius. Okay, so they form an isolated system at constant pressure. Okay, so we're going to calculate the final temperature of both silver samples, and we're also going to calculate the delta S for the hot silver sample and the delta S for the cold silver sample, and the total delta S for the system. Okay, so we want to determine if the process is spontaneous or not. Okay, so overall, let's just draw out a schematic of what this problem is asking. Okay, so let's write down our piece of silver A. Okay, so we have this piece of silver A, which is at 150 degrees Celsius, or in terms of Kelvin, this is 423.15 Kelvin. Okay, so this is our hot piece of silver. Okay, so it's brought into contact with our colder piece of silver. Okay, so this is B. Okay, so it's at 0 degrees Celsius, or in terms of Kelvin, 273.15 Kelvin. Okay, so what do we know about the nature of heat flow? Okay, so heat flow occurs between two bodies and it's going to be spontaneous if one body is at a higher temperature than the other body. Okay, so heat flows from a body that has a higher temperature to a body that has a lower temperature. Okay, so our heat flow is going to go in this direction. Okay, so when is it going to stop? Okay, so heat flow is going to stop when the final temperature of silver A is going to be equal to the final temperature of silver B, okay? So knowing, so overall guys, knowing what's happening in our problem is very, very useful in trying to solve this, okay? So I really suggest that you start drawing out and figure out what's happening in the process before you start trying to solve anything, all right? Okay, so overall, our heat flow is going to go from A to B, okay? So these two pieces of silver are going to make an isolated system. So it's kind of like a calorimeter. Okay, so overall the heat from A plus the heat from B is going to be equal to zero. Okay, so QA is equal to negative QB. Okay, so anything that silver A is going to be releasing is going to be absorbed by silver B. All right, so this is a very important relationship to establish. Okay, so we could define what QA is going to be. So this is going to be equal to the number of moles of A times the heat capacity times the change in temperature. So this is going to be TF minus the initial temperature of A. Okay, so keep in mind that TF for both silver A and silver B are going to be the same. Okay, so QB, this is going to be N 
B, number of moles of B times the CP of silver times TF minus TIB. Okay? So overall, we could solve for the final temperature by setting these two equations equal, okay, and introducing a negative sign. So we have Na CP TF minus TIA, okay, is equal to negative NB CP TF minus TIB, all right? Okay, so a bunch of things could cancel, okay? So since we're dealing with the same material, silver, the CP could cancel out, okay? So the number of moles of silver A and the number of moles of silver B are also equal, so we could also cancel this out, okay? So ultimately, if we rearrange this equation, we could see that TF is going to be equal to TIB, plus TIA divided by 2, okay? So based on this particular problem, it looks like the final temperature is just going to be the average of the two initial temperatures, okay? So keep in mind that this is not a universal kind of truth, okay? So it just so happens that we have an average of these two temperatures because we're dealing with the same amount of material and we're dealing with the same kind of material, okay? So overall, if we're calculating the final temperature, okay, so this becomes... 348.15 K, okay, or 75 degrees Celsius, okay? So this is the final temperature of our two pieces of silver, all right? Okay, so the next part of this problem is to calculate the entropy change for the hot silver and the entropy change for the cold silver, okay? So let's move on to some extra space over here, okay? So if we're going to calculate the entropy change for silver A, Okay, so this is just going to be equal to, okay, so we're going to assume that we have constant heat capacity. So this is going to be equal to NCP LN TF over TIA, all right? Okay, so we established what the final temperature is, okay, so we have one mole, okay, so the heat capacity is 25.75 joules per mole Kelvin, and our LN is, okay, so final temperature is 348. 0.15 Kelvin divided by 423.15 Kelvin, okay? So if we calculate this, the entropy change for silver A, the hot silver, this is going to be negative 5.02 joules per Kelvin, okay? So note that we have a decrease in the entropy of our hot silver because we had a heat flow out of the hot silver and we had a corresponding decrease in temperature, okay? So let's try to calculate the entropy change for the cold silver, okay? So again, we're going to be dealing with the same equation, so NCP, LN, TF over the initial temperature of our cold silver, okay? So this is going to be one mole times the heat capacity, so 25.75 joules per mole Kelvin times the LN of 348.15 Kelvin divided by 423.15 Kelvin, okay? And if we calculate this, we get 6.25 joules per Kelvin, okay? So this is the corresponding entropy change for the cold piece of silver, okay? So this makes sense because we have a corresponding heat flow in towards the cold piece of silver, so we have a corresponding increase in entropy, okay? So now let's look at the total entropy for the system. So delta S for the whole system is just going to be the sum of these two. Okay, so delta S A plus delta S B. So if we calculate this, this is ultimately going to be a positive value. So positive 1.23 joules per Kelvin. Okay, so we can see here that the delta S is positive for this isolated system. Okay, so for isolated systems, we said that if the entropy is positive, this process is spontaneous. Okay, all right, so there you have it. Here's an example of an entropy calculation problem. Okay, so again, a very important reminder in, calc in looking at these types of problems is try to think about what happens in our process. Okay, so from here, we establish that heat is going to flow from our hotter object to our colder object, and the final temperature should be equal once thermal equilibrium is established. Okay, 
So now let's look at another type of process, with, which is our isothermal process, okay? So this isothermal process could be reversible or irreversible, okay? But keep in mind that the type of heat that we'll be using in calculating our entropy is just going to be our reversible heat, okay? So again, dS is equal to dQ reversible over T, okay? So for an isothermal process, okay, especially for an ideal gas... Okay, so for an ideal gas, we know that dQ reversible, this is just going to be equal but in opposite sign to our reversible work. Okay, so if we're calculating our reversible work, we know that D, that our reversible work is equal to negative P gas dV. Okay, so we could write this as negative nRT over V dV, okay? So this is for our reversible work, okay? So if we're going to calculate the reversible heat, this is going to be positive nRT dV over V, okay? So we could input this expression in our expression for entropy, okay? So dS, this is going to be equal to nRT dV over V divided by T, so these temperatures just cancel out, and our dS is going to be equal to nR dV over V, okay? So for an ideal gas process, okay, so delta S is going to be equal to nR ln V2 over V1, okay? So this is for an isothermal process for an ideal gas, okay? Okay, so again, just to emphasize, we're dealing with processes that do not involve phase changes, okay? So we'll be looking at phase changes a little separately later on, okay? So let's look at if we have a com combination of processes, okay? So say that our process isn't exactly isothermal or isobaric or isochoric, but rather we're changing all of the parameters at the same time, okay? So in this particular process, we want to determine the change in entropy for one mole of helium that is undergoing the following process. Okay, so the initial state has temperature 1 and a certain pressure 1, and then in the final state, both the temperature and the pressures are changing, okay? We don't exactly have a one-step way in order to calculate this but luckily for us we're dealing with entropy right so entropy is a state function okay so that means we could figure out an alternate but equivalent pathway in order to get to the final state okay so there are two ways in which we could solve this one way is that we could split up this process into two parts okay so say for step one we could do this process isothermally okay so we're going to keep the temperature constant and then we're going to increase the pressure to the final pressure, so 15 atmospheres. Okay, so this is our isothermal process. This is going to correspond to our delta S1. Okay, so our next step, this could now be our isobaric process. Okay, and then we're, not, we're going to calculate delta S2. Okay, so overall our delta S is going to be the sum of delta S1 plus delta S2. Okay. okay, so let's write down the expression for the isothermal and the isobaric process. Okay, so overall delta S, this is going to be equal to nR ln V2 over V1. Okay, so this is for the isothermal process. Plus for the isobaric process, this is going to be NCP ln T2 over T1. Okay, so CP for this particular system, so we're dealing with helium, right? So this is a monatomic gas. Okay, so CP, this is going to be equal to 5 halves R, okay? So in our particular problem, okay, our change in condition is in terms of pressures, okay? So for our first step, we're going to have 298 Kelvin as our, as our temperature, and we're going to change the pressure from 150 ATM to 15 ATM. Okay, so for our particular expression over here, our changing condition is in terms of volume. Okay, so we could easily calculate the volume or we could just make an alternate expression for this over here. Okay, so we're dealing with an ideal gas, right, at constant temperature. So we could rewrite the ratio as nRT over P2 divided by nRT over P1. Okay, so this cancels out and we could rewrite our expression as P1 over P2. Okay. So overall delta S, this is going to be equal to nR ln P1 over P2 
plus NCP ln T2 over T1. Okay, so overall we have one mole times R times ln, okay, so pressure 1 is 1.50 atm divided by 15 atm plus 1 mole, okay, so our CP is 5 halves R times ln and the temperature change, which is 100 Kelvin divided by 298 Kelvin. Okay, so overall, the entropy change is going to be equal to negative 41.84 joules per Kelvin. Okay, so the main takeaway for this problem is that if we're calculating for entropy, we could split up the process of interest into different parts so that the calculation could be more convenient for us. Okay, so this is possible since entropy is a state function. Okay. Okay, so now let's look at adiabatic processes, okay? So if we have an adiabatic process, we could conduct this process either reversibly or irreversibly, okay? So if we have a reversible adiabatic process, right off the bat, we already know something about the reversible heat involved, okay? So in this case, dq rev is already going to be equal to zero, okay? So recall again that our entropy is defined as dq reversible over t, so right off the bat, we already know that since dq rev is equal to zero, so that means that ds is going to be equal to zero, okay? So the change in entropy for a reversible adiabatic process is already going to be equal to zero. So we could prove this using an ideal gas that is undergoing a reversible adiabatic expansion, okay? So let's just recall how this is going to happen. So let's draw a PV diagram here, and we have two isotherms, okay? So if our gas is undergoing an expansion, okay? So all the parameters, the pressure, the temperature, and the volume are going to be changing, okay? So if we start here with volume one and then temperature one, we know that our gas is going to expand to volume two and at temperature two, okay? So overall, we have our gas, which is at temperature one and volume one, Okay, and then we're changing the conditions so that it goes to temperature 2 and volume 2. Okay, so we could look at this as sort of a combined process. We could calculate the corresponding change in entropy by, say, conducting this in isothermal conditions first. Okay, so gas at T1 expanding towards V2 and then at isochoric conditions, okay, so our gas at V2, okay, changing in temperature to temperature 2, okay. So we could do a very similar procedure as what we did earlier, okay, so when we calculate delta S, okay, we're going to be calculating the entropy of the first step, which is our isothermal step, so we could write this as NR ln V2 over V1, and we could write down the entropy change for the isochoric step, which is plus NCV ln T2 over T1, okay? So based on the fact that we have an adiabatic reversible expansion, we know something about the relationship between these two values over here, okay? So since we have dq rev as equal to zero, so this means that du is equal to dw reversible. Okay, so let's just review some of the things that we know about these two parameters. So we know that du is equal to ncv dt, okay, and dw, this is going to be equal to negative nrt over v times dv, okay. So upon rearrangement, okay, we, we will get ncv dt over t, okay, which is equal to negative nr dv over V, and upon integration from temperature 1 to temperature 2, volume 1 to volume 2, we will get NCV ln T2 over T1 is equal to negative NR ln V2 over V1, okay? So you could see here that we could replace, say, this term with negative NR ln V2 over V1, Okay, so negative nr ln v2 over v1 plus nr ln v2 over v1, this is going to be equal to zero as predicted since dq rev is equal to zero. 
Okay, so this is just a little proof to show how for a reversible adiabatic process, ds or delta s is going to be equal to zero. Okay, however, let's look at the case when we have an adiabatic process that happens irreversibly. Okay, so it's very, very tempting to think that since we have an adiabatic process and we know that for this particular process, dq is going to be equal to zero, it's super tempting to think that delta s is also going to be equal to zero. Okay, however, this is not always the case. Okay, what we do know about this process is that dq, okay, so since this happens irreversibly, we know that dq irreversible is equal to zero, but this doesn't necessarily mean that dq reversible, which is used to calculate delta s, is equal to zero, okay, so we don't know this, okay, so actually it's not equal to zero, okay, so Let's consider the equation that we got earlier. Okay, so again, for an adiabatic process that's irreversible, so let's use an ideal gas as a basis for this. Okay, so we know that our gas is going to be changing in temperature and volume. Okay, so we could use the same basic equation for this. Okay, so delta S, okay, this is going to be equal to NCV ln T2 over T1 plus nr ln v2 over v1 okay so this time however since we're dealing with an irreversible process the relationship between these two expressions are not going to be the same thing as it was before okay so actually we have a very different relationship over here what we do know about an adiabatic irreversible process du is equal to dw so let's just write this down as irreversible okay so we know that du is going to be ncv dt and dw is going to be equal to negative p external dv, okay? So we're not going to have the same relationship as what we had earlier for our reversible process, okay? So these terms over here, they're not necessarily going to be canceling each other out. So delta s is not necessarily going to be equal to zero. Okay, so next let's look at reversible phase changes. Okay, so reversible phase changes are a little bit more straightforward to consider because they typically occur at constant temperature and pressure. Okay, so just as a review, we just have to keep in mind that for reversible phase changes, okay, so we have our two phases. So let's look at the melting of ice. Okay, the temperature is going to remain constant as we have our phase change occurring. Okay, so we have our solid phase and our liquid phase in equilibrium at constant temperature okay, while the phase change is occurring. Okay, so if we're going to calculate the change in entropy for this process, okay, so ds is equal to dq reversible divided by temperature and we integrate this from the initial to the final state. Okay. So this gives us delta S. So keep in mind that our temperature is constant. So that means our equation for delta S is just going to be equal to the reversible heat involved in the process divided by temperature. Okay, so since we're dealing with constant pressure conditions, okay, so this means that the heat involved is our QP. Okay, so this is associated with our enthalpy. Okay, so we could use the enthalpy of the phase change in order to calculate our delta S. Okay, so we could rewrite this as N delta H of the phase change divided by temperature. Okay, so this is how we calculate the entropy change for a corresponding phase change. Okay, so let's try to apply this equation in our problem over here. So in this particular case, we want to calculate the entropy change of the universe when one mole of ice melts when placed in a room at 25 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere. Okay, so the enthalpy of fusion is given as follows. Okay, so again, we're dealing with the melting of ice. So the process is just we have our ice over here, okay, and then it's going to be melting into our liquid form. Okay, so once we have melting, okay, so let's say that we have our ice over here, okay, so our ice is going to be at zero degrees Celsius, so this is our system, and the surroundings, our room, is going to be at 25 degrees Celsius, okay, so the phase change is always going to occur at the corresponding 
melting point, which at one atmosphere is zero degrees Celsius. Okay, so if we're going to calculate the entropy change of the universe, we're going to be calculating the entropy change of our ice, our system, and the entropy change of the surroundings, which is our room. Okay, so the entropy change for the ice, this is N delta H fusion divided by the corresponding temperature of the ice plus plus the heat involved for the surroundings. Okay, so keep in mind that when we're melting ice, okay, so the melting of ice is an endothermic process. Okay, so we're going to have a corresponding heat flow from the surroundings into the system. Okay, so that means that we have an equal amount of heat involved, but in opposite sign. Okay, so our heat involved from the surroundings, okay, so our surroundings is going to be giving up a corresponding n times delta h fusion. Okay, so that is negative n delta h fusion divided by the corresponding temperature of the room, okay, or the temperature of the surroundings, okay? So this is our delta s universe, okay? So if we plug in on our values over here, so delta s universe, okay, so this is going to be, so we have one mole of ice, okay? So the enthalpy of fusion, let's put this in terms of kilojoules, so 6.03 times 10, 10 to the 3 joules per mole, divided by the temperature of our ice k okay, in kelvin so that is 273.15 k plus negative one mole times 6.03 times 10 to the 3 joules per mole divided by the temperature of our surroundings which is 298.15 kelvin Okay, so if we calculate delta S universe, okay, the value that we should get here is positive 1.85 joules per Kelvin. Okay, so we can see that the value here is positive. Okay, so the entropy change of the universe is positive. Therefore, the melting of ice at room temperature is spontaneous as suspected. Okay. So now let's look at the last process of interest, which is the mixing of inert ideal gases at constant temperature and pressure. Okay, so say that we have these two gases, okay, these two ideal gases at volume one and N1, and this other gas at volume two N2. Okay, so again we're dealing with constant temperature and pressure. Okay, so say that we remove this barrier. Okay, so if we remove this barrier, intuitively we know that these two gases are going to spontaneously mix together. Okay, so we're interested in calculating the entropy change involved in this process over here. Okay, so important things just to keep in mind, okay, so since we're dealing with ideal gases, okay, so ideal gases, recall, have no interactions between these particles. Okay, so actually, if we have gas 1 here mixing with gas 2 over here, okay, so it doesn't really care about the presence of the other gas, okay? So also keep in mind that we have constant temperature, okay? So we're dealing with an isothermal process, okay? So recall again from our discussion on ideal gas processes that if we have an isothermal process, okay, so the change in internal energy and the change in enthalpy is going to be equal to zero, okay? So we could model this process splitting it up into two steps, okay? So we could split this up into what happens to just gas 1 and what happens to gas 2, okay? So again, these are ideal gases, so they don't really care about the, other, the presence of the other gas, okay? So if we remove gas 2 in this case over here, okay, so we just have gas 1, okay, and we have a vacuum on this other side over here, and if we remove the barrier, we can kind of see that the gas is just expanding into the new total volume of the mixture, okay? So the same thing goes for gas 2 over here, okay? So gas 2 is in its initial volume over here on its own, okay? So we have a vacuum on this side over here. So upon removal of this barrier, our gas 2 is just going to expand to the total volume of the mixture, okay? So we could look at the entropy change of this expansion for gas 1 and the entropy change of this expansion of gas 2 and sum them all together and this will be our overall entropy of mixing. Okay, so let's look at for gas one. Okay, so 
again, we're dealing with an isothermal expansion. Okay, so what we can do here is just we could use the equation for an isothermal expansion. So delta S of gas 1, this is going to be equal to N1 R ln V total. Okay, so this is the final volume over V1. So actually, we could also write this ratio in another fashion. Okay, so recall the definition of mole fraction. Okay, so mole fraction can be written as the volume of 1 over the total volume of the system. Okay, so this means that the reciprocal of our mole fraction, this is going to be equal to V total over V1. Okay, so delta S1, this could be rewritten as negative N1 R ln times the mole fraction of 1. Okay, so it's very useful to use mole fraction because we're going to be dealing with mixtures, right? Okay, so we could also do the same treatment for gas 2. Okay, so again, this is an isothermal expansion process. Okay, so delta S2, this is just going to be equal to number of moles of gas 2 times R ln V total, which is the final volume, over V2. Okay, so again, we could do the same replacement for this ratio over here. Okay, so we could rewrite this as delta S2 is equal to negative N2R ln times the mole fraction of component 2. Okay, so if we put these two things together and calculate the total entropy change for the mixing process, this is going to be equal to delta S is equal to negative N1R ln times the mole fraction of 1 minus N2R ln times the mole fraction of 2. Okay, so we could generalize this expression for the mixing of multiple components. Okay, so in general, the entropy of mixing, okay, so this is going to be equal to negative R, okay, times the summation of the number of moles of component I times the ln of its mole fraction. Okay, so we're going to sum up, sum up all of these terms for all of the components. Okay, so this is R entropy of mixing okay so we could actually write this in another way okay so recall again the definition of mole fraction okay so we could define mole fraction as just the number of moles of component i over the total number of moles okay so that means that the number of moles of i can be written as total number of moles times the mole fraction of component i okay so we can make a corresponding replacement for this term over here Okay, so we could rewrite the entropy of mixing as negative NTR times the summation of the mole fraction of component I times the LN of the mole fraction of component I, okay, summed over all of the components. Okay, so this again is the expression for the entropy of mixing. Okay, so typically this value is positive. Okay, so this entropy expression explains why mixing is a spontaneous process. Okay, so let's try to apply this equation by solving this problem over here. Okay, so we want to calculate the entropy of mixing 10 liters of nitrogen with 3.5 liters of N2O at 300 Kelvin and 0 0.550 ATM. Okay, so we're going to assume that volumes are additive. Okay, so first and foremost, let's calculate the total volume. Okay, so again, we're assuming that volumes were additive. So if we mix these two gases together, it's just going to be 10 liters plus 3.5 liters. So our total volume is 13.5 liters. Okay, so the next thing we want to know is the total number of moles of gas. Okay, so we could solve this using the ideal gas equation. Okay, so this is... Nt is equal to the pressure times the total volume divided by Rt. Okay, so upon calculating this, okay, so our pressure is 0 0.550 atm. Okay, total volume is 13.50 liters. Okay, so R is 0 0.08206 liters atmosphere per mole Kelvin. And our temperature is 300K. Okay, so the total number of moles is just 0 0.302 moles. 
Okay, so it's also of interest for us to calculate the corresponding mole fractions. Okay, so the mole fraction of one, this is going to be the mole fraction of our nitrogen gas. So this is going to be equal to just the volume of our nitrogen gas divided by the total volume. And for the mole fraction of N2O, this is going to be equal to 3.5 liters divided by 13.50 liters. Okay, so we have all of the parameters that we need in order to calculate our entropy of mixing. So our equation is, recall, is equal to negative NTR, okay, with the summation of mole fraction of component 1 times the ln of mole fraction of component 1 plus the mole fraction of component 2 times the ln of mole fraction of component 2. Okay, so if we plug in all these values, okay, so the total number of moles is 0 0.302 moles. We have negative 0 0.302 moles times R. Okay, so in this case, our R is going to be 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And we input our corresponding mole fractions. Okay, so this is just 10 over 13.5 times ln 10 over 13.5 plus... 3.5 divided by 13.5 ln 3.5 divided by 13.5. So ultimately, the entropy of mixing these two gases is positive 1.44 joules per Kelvin. Okay, so the mixing of these two gases is again a spontaneous process. All right, so just to sum up the different types of processes that we've discussed. Let's try to solve this problem over here, okay? So hopefully you recognize this problem as one of the earlier problems that we've discussed from our previous lecture, okay? So back in that lecture, we calculated the heat, the work, the change in internal energy, and the change in enthalpy for each step of the process and for the entire cycle, okay? So this time we want to calculate the entropy change for the system for each step of the process and for the total cycle, okay? So previously we already calculated the different states of the system, Okay, so we'll be referring to those results in this problem over here. Okay, so let's look at the entropy change for step one. So that is from A to B. Okay, so based on the plot, we could tell that this is an isobaric process. Okay, so in that case, and we're also dealing with an ideal gas. Okay, so that means the delta S for step A to B is just going to be delta S is equal to NCP ln t2 over t1 okay so if we're going to input all of this okay so recall again that for a diatomic gas cp is going to be equal to seven halves r okay so we're dealing with one mole so one mole times seven halves r times ln temperature two is 800 k divided by temperature one which is 200 k so that means delta s for a to b this is just 40.34 joules per Kelvin. Okay, so this is for our first step. So next, let's look at our second step, which is our isochoric step. Okay, so we'll be calculating the step B to C. Okay, so for an ideal gas, delta S for an isochoric process is just going to be equal to NCV ln T2 over T1. Okay, so again, we're dealing with a diatomic gas, okay, so we know that the CV is going to e be equal to 5 halves R, okay, so this is going to be equal to, okay, so 1 mole times 5 halves R times LN, okay, so final temperature, this is going to be 200 Kelvin, divided by initial temperature, so that is 800 Kelvin, okay, so delta S for the second step is going to be equal to negative 28 point. 81 joules per Kelvin. Okay, so lastly, let's look at our third step. So our third step is our isothermal process. Okay, so this is step C to A. Okay, so again, for an isothermal process for an ideal gas, delta S is going to be equal to NR ln V2 over V1. Okay, so this is just going to be equal to 1 mole times R 
times ln, okay, so final volume, this is 4.103 liters, divided by the initial volume, so that is 16.412 liters. And if we calculate this, this is going to be equal to negative 11.53 joules per Kelvin. Okay, so this is the entropy change for the third step. Okay, so lastly, we want to calculate the entropy change for the total cycle. So let's just summarize each of the values that we got here. Okay, so for step A to B, we got 40.34 joules per Kelvin. Okay, so for step 2, we got negative 28.81 joules per Kelvin. And for the third step, we got negative 11.53 joules per Kelvin. Okay, so we can see that if we add all of them up, okay, so the delta S for the entire cycle is going to be equal to zero as expected. So again, this just emphasizes how entropy is a state function. Okay. Okay, so that concludes our discussion for this lecture. Okay, so up next we'll be discussing the third law of thermodynamics. We'll also be looking at standard molar entropies and we'll start calculating the entropy changes involved for chemical reactions. Okay, and later on We'll also try to establish alternative criteria for equilibrium. Okay?